My name is Michael Brainerd, for those of you who don't know me. And um, I, our topic is um, sort of different thinking in developing executives. Um, and throughout the day, I'll make the distinction between management training, leadership development, and then what I've carved off as executive development. And the spirit of my talk is I'm talking to you as HR professionals, people who either design or deliver the executive development function in your organization. Many of you probably don't even make the distinction. We kind of call it leadership development. So one of the first things I'd like us to think about is at that vice president level and above, um, much like children, nothing, I'll keep working on you. Much like children, they learn and develop slightly differently is what I've learned through not my education, but my street smarts. And so we're going to talk about today how we can, as HR professionals, get in and deliver executive development somewhat differently or think about it somewhat differently. So my goal for you is to gain an insight or two or something you can take back and put into practice. This is this perspective. As you think about leadership development, most of your energy and effort probably is at the manager and director level. They're sort of the shoulders of your organization. They lead the most people, and they're easy to develop because typically they're not smart asses. Nothing? You weren't supposed to say it. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Executives sit in this room, Janet, this room, when you start standing up and saying, hey, we really need to get better at strategic thinking, decision making, coaching and mentoring people, and they typically sit back and go, really? Really? Another HR person telling me I should be a little bit better or different, yet I've been doing this for 20 plus years and I'm pretty darn good at it. From the perspective of the executive, HR is probably the least well positioned to develop and design executive programs. And when they are, they typically shoot themselves in the foot. Most times your development happens when you're uncomfortable. Most time real introspection and real growth happens from a place of discomfort or awkwardness, not always. But when you have those moments and you are able to introspect and learn, that's where you usually get those stepwise increments. From the perspective of the executive, I'd like you to take note of this. You cannot develop an executive without creating a gap. You have to create the learning gap. From the perspective of the executive, I've been there, I've done that, even if it's not true. Even if that's not true, you guys know it's not true. You have a lot of incomplete and broken executives. But their perspective is, I've been quite successful. I've been leading large organizations in multiple times and multiple places for many years. What are you going to teach me? Come and get me. And HR people, I found, take the bait. So from the perspective of the executive, in your program build, in your design, there's several things we're going to do to think about creating a gap, and we'll talk about those in a moment. The most obvious is assessments. But the second most obvious, if you read that Harvard Business Review, is you want to tether your executive development programs to three things. And we'll come back to this in a minute. Business outcomes, the strategic plan, and the individual gaps, the individual developmental gaps. From the perspective of the market, from the perspective of the market, there are three types of executive development programs, and really only three. You can categorize most programs that you run, including coaching, into one of these three. From the market perspective, when you go and develop or buy executive development, you're buying either a psychologically based approach, CCL. Everybody's heard of CCL? There's lots of programs like CCL. Send them to the mountain, get with a psychologist, crack their skull open, have this transformative experience, come back a different person. I was a jerk, now I'm not. Yada, yada, yada. Everybody, everybody heard of these? You have the you have the academic-based programs, right? Kellogg, Stanford, blah, 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 marketing, go learn strategy, go learn whatever, and it's a mini MBA kind of deal. And then you have my least favorite. I'm sorry, did I say that or was I thinking that? Lori, you're gonna be offended here, and Lori's been a friend of mine for nearly 20 years. 
these competency internally homegrown programs. Competency-based training programs. So let's first start with a needs assessment, and then we're going to develop a competency profile. This is the best model for best practices of leaders in our organization, and then we're going to design all of our training and all of our assessments around the competency model. That's incredibly egocentric. That's incredibly self-centered an, and self-serving from an HR perspective. Executive development, it's much too insular. It's much too inside baseball. When you think about your competency profile, that's a starting point. But it's not the end point. In 2011, please look up this study. There are so few good studies in our field, in the field of leadership development. I'm talking about true studies, almost even empirical studies. Should be snickering. No snickers? In 2011, there was an article written by McKinsey and Agon Zender. They co-published an article. And I'll summarize the article. In summary, they started from the bottom up, which I always like, meaning we're not going to start, we're going to start with a hypothesis, but we're going to go and collect pri primary data. We're not going to use secondary data. And so what they did was they used an assessment that Agon Zender uses to define highly effective executives. And they started interviewing more than 1,000 executives, and they found that 7% of the population was truly high performing. So forget all the detail I'm summarizing. So what they found then was of those 7%, they went back and they interviewed those 7% and they observed them in the workplace. This was a year and a half long study. It was a fantastic study and one of the few studies in our field that is empirical. What they found was a competency profile that seems to be consistent across industries and across companies for executive performance. I'll show you that in a little bit. But what you care about is that when you think about from a market perspective, what are we delivering? I hear HR people have a knee-jerk reaction because they have a buddy that works for CEL, CCL or it worked for them before. Let's send them to CCL. Let's send them off down to La Jolla, get them cracked open, bring them back. They'll be nice. Then we think about the MBA programs. We've got to round out this young exec. You don't know marketing. Let's send them to Kellogg. They're sort of all good, but they're sort of incomplete. And same with your HR approach to executive development. For leadership development, fine. Management training works great. For executive development, it's way too insular. It's way too small-minded to build a competency profile and build a bunch of developmental initiatives around it for executives. Executives have to be boundary spanning. One of the things we know from that article and your own experience is that executives have to be boundary spanners. They have to operate with permeable boundaries. When an executive starts to falter, you find that they start thinking too narrowly. They don't think about competition. They walk around thinking, well, we're the biggest one in the industry. We're the greatest. What I've done for the last 20 years is this, and so it'll work again. Sort of that Robert Nardelli type of syndrome, right? We have to allow executives to breathe and have permeable boundaries both inside the organization and outside the organization, as well as inside their own head and interacting with others. They have to have flow of information going both directions. But I just watch us fall short, right? I watch HR professionals fall short and not acknowledging the difference between somebody who's been a leader for 20 years, works at the enterprise level, and then it's our job to develop them. And we approach them in very traditional ways, and I think we miss the mark or miss the opportunity to add greater value, and that's the whole premise of the setup here. Let's start with something obvious. Most of us, when we establish and begin to build our model for our organization, think from a very inside-out perspective. And while this is not rocket science, I would like to challenge us to think backwards. And this is one of the reasons I don't think you can set a date and roll out your executive development program. I think it's very important that we understand that executive development can't be set to a calendar. It has to be set to an event. Either a critical business change or your strategic planning cycle in that order. So, we will be developing an executive development approach and then we will partner with the C-suite and we will wait to place our development program. How many of you like that idea? Oh, I was surprised yesterday no one raised their hand. <laughs> because the logical pushback is, but Michael, I finally got budget. I got budget, I hired Brainerd or some internal couple of OD people and I designed this thing and we're ready to go. We got buy-in, I got an executive sponsor. Does this all sound traditional? Right? I got budget, I got buy-in, I got my executive champion, I got them in a room, I got the coffee, I got the hotel, let's go. Interesting, traditional, 
but I find it much more interesting to work to design our program not from a talent management perspective, but truly from a business perspective. I talk to HR people all the time. I said, Mike, we're very, I'm a very business-focused HR person. I said, well, when's the last time you had a line job outside of HR? Because it's hard to get in someone's shoes if you haven't been in someone's shoes. So it's not bad that we do this. It's just very traditional. What I like to do is I like to understand at least the strat plan and figure out in ECD, in what are we trying to accomplish? Is it, is it survival? Is it profitability? Is it inorganic growth? What is the actual business change or challenge that's happening? Who are the people involved and what's their gap? So I don't want to invite all my hypos. I want to invite the execs who are approaching a chasm, who are approaching an actual business cliff. Because I know that disruption creates gap. And I know without gap, it's hard to sell what I'm selling. Some of the soft skill stuff and thinking strategically and using coaching and development skills, you know, I kind of know that already. What are you going to show me? What are you going to show me that's new? Well, if I've got a business gap where I truly could succeed or fail in the next year, that's the population I want to grab. So people always say, well, how do we work with hypos and not let the non-hypos, they're not involved, get over it, HR. Honestly, get over it. Hypos are hypos. Let's tell them they're hypos. The fact that other people don't know they're hypos, maybe they want to become that. We have to be much more adult-like and much more honest in our conversations with our leaders. But let's go backwards. Let's get those high pose, high performers who are involved in the business cliff. Let's make sure the business cliff drives this. Let's make sure that we've got the issues identified, market, competitive, organizational. Forget talent management. Forget your competency. What are the specific challenges? Are they strategic in nature? Are they about talent development and retention in nature? Are they about geographical expansion? Are they about product expansion? Let's identify the business issues we're trying to solve and tether our learning to those business issues. Because remember, we're developing executives. Presumably, they have fundamental management skills. When we think with our competency profile, we typically then default to management skill building. Executive development is not management skill building. It's executive development. Then we get back to, OK, let's get closer to what we know. We're process people in this room, right? We know about how to develop strategic thinking. We know about how to develop people who can be good at talent development or org building org capability. We know about how to help people with change, leading change. This is our sphere, right? So now we can start to attach what we know to the business issues. And then finally, we can call this thing leadership development or talent development if we like, and it should net in some human or process outcomes. Training for its own sake and for the sake of individual development and even cohort development, it's very difficult to get a return on that. It's very difficult to capture the hearts and minds of the persons being developed. As a matter of fact, for decades, it's been greeted with cynicism. How many of you have a great program, a good consulting partner, a really neat approach, and then you walk in the room and people are like this? Been through this before, it sucked. Got to get to my email. Got to get to my email. I, in our Accelerate programs, I tell people, use your email. Go ahead, open up your laptops. Do email all day if you want. If that's more important than what we're doing, please, this is a market-based approach. I don't care about your phone and email. Do it. And now we're in, they're not doing it. This, in order of importance, when you think about creating the gap, specifically, how do you do it? One, the business challenge. Two, the strategic plan. Something in that strat plan for the next year is important to some subset of your population. And then three, the use of assessments in that order. People don't change because they want to. People change because they have to. True or false? You are all experienced people. But we forget this, don't we? Executive development is creating change. It's creating change. And yet the first thing we do is sell it. Here's how it's going to be good for you. Here's how it's going to be good for your people. Here's how Here's the vision. John Cotter taught us 25 years ago. The third most important step in driving change is creating a vision for a better future. But the first step is creating a sense of urgency. Does everybody remember this? The first step in driving change is to make people uncomfortable. Heat the platform. Particularly with 20 years of experience and 20 years of success. How am I going to open my, you get the idea? Third is the vision of a better future. First is the urgency. 
So point number one is executive development, I believe, can't happen without a gap. A wrinkle in your thinking ought to be we can create the gap from the business change, the strategic plan, or the individual assessments. If we can use all three, or two or three, fantastic. You cannot develop executives without addressing their learning gaps, full stop. And then finally, I've been through coaching, what's different about this? I've been through training, I've been through coaching, how's it helped the business? If we see previous set of slides, it helps the business. It not only helps, it is the business. As a part of this change, you will get some learning to go along with that. As a part of the strategic plan, you will get some preparation to help us be more successful. When you think about your executive development program, think about, like, think about a chef. Get all your ingredients out there. Start with your design principles. Work backwards from the business change. Business change, what's in the strat plan, individual development needs. Forget your competency model. So we're going to start. How global, how scalable, psychologically based, MBA sort of academic based, sort of competency based. Let's get that blend right. And then let's put all the ingredients on the table. Let's use our assessment techniques. That creates learning gap. Let's use customized coaching where we can. Let's use a little training where we can. Let's use experiential learning where we can. Nobody reads books anymore. Stop with the books. You're not going to be a better leader by reading a book. You're going to go get a better leader by getting calluses on your hand. Work your business. Practice. You're uncomfortable giving feedback? Give more feedback. Read books to get frameworks. There's nothing good written since good to great. There's nothing good written since leadership and self-deception. Be honest. There's nothing good written. And by the way, executives don't read books. They don't have time. They have families and lives and they're working 60 hours a week. TED Talks, white papers, just-in-time digital, just-in-time short, tight, spiky, tight things to my needs. Books. Nobody reads books anymore. Assessment centers, coaching, training, experiential. And then we talked about it last, action learning. Trial and error. These are adults. Get them out there in the business. Get them out there on a plane. Get them out there and then equip them to do some project that they're accountable for. Executives are not managers and directors. Embarrass them. Let me say it again. We do action learning projects in module three of our six modules, and what's the first thing I say is you will be evaluated by the C-suite. They will be watching you present. Are you nervous? This ain't nice. This is your development, this is your career. Take it seriously. You're on stage for 20 minutes talking about your action learning project, your business deliverable. This ain't nice to have. You got presentation skills, you got team skills, you got strategy skills, you got change management skills, you got business planning skills. Now let's see you use them. You're accountable. You could fail. You want to create learning, create change, create discord, create urgency. Get out of the room, get out of the comfortable setting, get out of the HR mindset, get out of the ground rules. No, we have to be respectful. No, we don't. Let's debate. Let's argue. Let's engage. Let's be asynchronous. Maybe not all the time, but we have to build that in. We as HR leaders are too busy trying to make everyone comfortable. That's not how people develop and grow. That's not how people develop and grow. That's not how you developed and grew. That's not how you developed and grew. Now, you have to have time to introspect. You have to have real assessments with objective information, not just your boss's bias information. You have to have a safe place to go and think. But you also have to be challenged. So I'm not saying we do this 100% of the time, but we have to spend a little bit more of our time thinking strategically rather than thinking just from an inside-out perspective as HR practitioners. If not, we get laughed or we get cynicism. Right? So we got to avoid the cynicism and the laughter. Be very thoughtful about our design outside-in, outside-in thinking. Competencies are to everything, and we're going to create gaps and exploit gaps and help people to develop, not train them to be nice. Executive coaching, executive training, executive development, unconscious bias, implicit bias, yeah? Right? Why does it matter? This construct has been uh, pulled out of the DNI space by me and has application into executive development. That's incredibly important. Um, what happens with executives specifically, uh, I think the net outcome is cynicism. It looks like you can't teach me anything. I've got my arms folded. I'm not interested. 
But what's behind that is far more insidious and negative and pervasive. And executive behavior largely has a collective impact on our business society that is incredibly harmful. And most of the harmful effects are out of our awareness. So when Goldman came out with EQ, other authors jumped all over it. My dear friends from San Diego, Gene Greaves and Travis Bairdvery, wrote the quick book. And they have a whole business, million dollar business, built upon EQ. It's not their idea, it's Goldman. They have great products and commercialized it, as so did about 40 other firms. But since EQ, nothing has come into the executive or leadership development space that's hit us that's been innovative from a content or a learner perspective, except for ripping out from the DNI space this thing called unconscious bias. So just a quick trajectory of diversity and inclusion. In the 80s, it was shame on you white guys for not including other people. In the 90s, it was Rodney King, why can't we all just get along? No chuckles still. <laughs> and now we're trying to convince people that they have blind spots and they should be aware of their blind spots. There is some very recent research that says driving awareness actually exacerbates the problem and doesn't add to a solution. A second and more harmful effect of the diversity and inclusion approach is that the diversity and inclusion approach takes our unconscious bias and doubles down on it. It does nothing to limit the impact of these implicit biases. As a matter of fact, it says let's proliferate these biases and over the next three to five decades that'll solve the problem. Never gonna work. We can debate this all day, you'll lose. How you like that? The diversity and inclusion approach to handling unconscious bias says we're all biased, it's part of the human condition, true. Therefore, let's put women and people of color into the C-suite and the boardroom, and in doing so, they will bring about and open doors for people like themselves. That's the diversity and inclusion approach to driving diversity and inclusion. Two problems with that. One, it says let's double down on this bias, and these proclivities. And two, it's gonna take decades to solve it that way. But three, and most importantly, Academy of Management, 2014, published a wonderful article that was republished in Harvard Business Review that says, when we put women and people of color into the C-suite and into the boardroom and we allow them to bring in other people like them, they get sanctioned and kicked out of the organization. It's a groundbreaking piece of research that you all should look up. I have the article on our website, and it is really well done. It, act, it says, people identified, people who are women and people of color, who are identified to be champions of diversity inside of organizations, we champion them, say, come on in and do this, and their tenure with the organization goes down by like 40%, and their reviews and bonuses go down. It's an empirical study that watches the tenure of the identified champion and what happens to the identified champion. We have three problems with how unconscious bias has been treated from a DNI perspective. One, it doubles down, it doubles down on the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. Two, even if it works, you're talking about decades. Decades to get the kind of increase in inclusion that we're seeking. And third, when we identify champions, we all then beat them up and kick them out. Doesn't work. What I'd rather have us do in executive development, executive development, these are not the people implementing policy, these are the people creating policy, creating procedure, creating the rules, informal and formal. What we want to do is bring the unconscious bias out of the expertise, out of the realm of the DNI space, and we want to put it into the executive and leadership development space. Now, what we want to say is unconscious bias is only the starting point and it impacts us in five specific ways as leaders. Please write this down if you don't know it. One, it negatively impacts our hiring decisions. We don't hire the best candidate, we hire the candidate we're most comfortable with. Two, we review people in our in-group more favorably than people in our out-group. Number two is performance review. Number three, promotion. We promote me, not Monica. I'm the archetype for a leader in corporate America. 
Monica is not. She has to work twice as hard, I don't know if it's twice, she has to work harder than me to get to that EVP level. I don't. Four, team formation. And five, innovation. Our implicit or out of awareness bias impacts us as leaders in five specific ways. Creating awareness is not what we're after. I'm not selling you on how the brain works. What is this, good or bad? Good or bad? Neither, it, it is. Unconscious bias is not the affliction of the majority class. I don't have more unconscious bias than you have. It's an affliction of the human condition. I ain't selling you that it exists. That's our approach. Forget awareness. What do we do about it? How does it impact my ability to make decisions? Not only make decisions, Lori, now we're talking to executives. How do I take in information? How do I process information? And what do I do with that information? How do I make decisions? Our biases narrow our worldview by biological reasons. So we just, we educate executives about this mechanism and it, there's no shame. It is what it is. The second problem is what Elizabeth Loftus talks about at UCI. She spent her life talking about retroactive inference. You see a car accident, I see a car accident, you see the same car accident. Police interview the three of us, what happened? Do they get one story, two stories, or three stories? Everybody knows in its simplest form, your memory is selective, and it's driven by the first bias. I attend to what is familiar and safe for me, and I kind of away from, move away from the other. Think about retroactive inference. Go to your CEO. I'm excellent at hiring. I hire top talent. Give me evidence of that. The CEO will say, Brian, Sally, Joe, and John, they're all superstars. And you'll say, what about Kevin, George, and Joe? I don't remember those people. I didn't hire them, you did. You know this, this is a silly example of retroactive inference. We select, it, we select stories from our past, we select experiences. We don't have an objective palette of experiences to pull from, we pull from the ones that make us feel best. It's called retroactive inference. So now I have these impulses to move toward or away from things that are familiar to me, that's out of awareness. But now as that stimuli moves from my brain, I actually tell myself stories. I'm right. I'm good with people. You suck with people. I'm good with these two people in these five situations, so you're wrong. That's called retroactive inference. And then the third form of bias in my bias trifecta that executives have to get comfortable with is Fox and MSNBC, right? It's confirmation bias. And we all know what confirmation bias is. How many of you walk around your environment looking for evidence, Maurice, that you're wrong? Of course you don't. The brain's an efficiency junkie. It looks for the quickest, cheapest, easiest answer. Oh, by the way, that one makes me feel the best. Confirmation bias happens here. Retroactive inference happens here. And unconscious bias happens here. I have an impulse. I attach a memory or a story to it. And then I go and look for evidence that I'm what? Right or wrong? When we're doing executive development, we have whether we're coaching, or simulations, training, whatever we're doing, we have to begin to break this, I have high tenure, I have high success, therefore my worldview is right. There's biological reasons and there's psychological reasons that these biases exist. We have to replace these biases with new behaviors and new practices. To try to get these biases tripled and doubled down by inclusion, interesting, long term. We need to challenge the behavior, educate and build new behavior because this stuff affects decision making. Not just in the five realms I'm talking about, but we can visibly have data and see the impact in these five areas. And when you have data and you can prove a business case, you got a hell of a lot better chance of changing the attitude and beliefs of these executives. We have data in these realms. In terms of learning content for execs, can we agree that this idea of this bias trifecta and how these play together to limit our worldview, right? 
That's really what happens. With our execs, what we want to do is take their world and widen it about this much. None of us are possible of, of processing this. We want to just get from here, I'm certain of what I know, and if you want to drive exec development, get people certain about what they don't know. I'm certain that I don't know about 15 other ways to drive change, to develop talent, to build capability, to approach an acquisition. Most of you and most execs, when they get presented with a new challenge, they find their laptop, they find a similar Excel file or PowerPoint that they used for a previous problem, and they edit from there. That's the most ready example that we all have this laziness and efficiency thing in our brain going. We have to challenge people to think differently, particularly about these five behaviors. That's the content that I think is relevant in executive development that might be new or a wrinkle. If you can correlate some movement in an impact variable to some perceived increase or decrease in efficiency or cost savings or revenue, and you can correlate, now you can say, hey, CFO, I don't have a one-for-one -one match, but I know I can measure engagement and I can correlate engagement of 500 employees with the productive metrics, that we, the KPIs that we've agreed upon. I've seen with low engagement, these particular KPIs move this way. With higher engagement, they move this way. So if we can get comfortable with not one-for-one -one relationships, but developing correlations between impact variables and outcome variables, we can begin to walk around that has, a, we have now have a case that says our development investment actually had an impact. It's not true ROI, but it has an impact on something that matters to the business. And if you don't believe what I'm saying and you think I'm shortcutting it, go to the engagement literature. We all know that the employee engagement literature has exploded in the last eight or nine years, and there's lots of good work done on employee engagement. In the really good white papers around employee engagement, they show us how to do correlations between engagement and typical productivity matrix. I'm sorry, metrics, forgive me. So we as HR professionals have been using the wrong math to try to prove our worth through development. We need to not go one side of the equation or the other. We need to look at inputs, look at impacts, and look at outcomes. And oh, by the way, most of us are running by the fundamentals. Smile sheets, behavior change, time one, time two, 360. I even have clients, Lori, who are spending lots of money on our Accelerate program, and they'll say, Mike, we don't have to do 360 after the program. And I'll say, well, well we, you know, it might be interesting when I have worked with groups or individuals in Accelerate or as a coach, um, when I'm working individually, I would like them to build new behaviors and or replace old behaviors around decision making specifically. So I'll ask you as a group of executives, and this is part of creating the gap, or I'll ask you as an individual. When you're approached with a problem that has no obvious answer, or you're approached with a problem that has choices at the end of it, you see those two different kinds of decisions? What's your method and what's your framework? The answer, Janet, is that answer is unacceptable. I don't care if you've got 20 years running R&D or sales, you're now entrusted to be an executive leader, you're a VP, going somewhere else, the company's spending 20,000 bucks for you to be talking to me right now. Unacceptable. This eighth grade dodgeball or innate talent thing that you brought to the table that got you here, unacceptable. Unacceptable. You can't be on CNBC and run Experian unless you have a method and a model for problem solving. Maybe two or three, depending on the type of problem to be solved. So to answer your question very specifically, I focus on decision making, and I want to help people with thinking that isn't new, but that they don't have and they're ignorant about. And when I can capture where they're ignorant and show them a mousetrap that's a shortcut or a better than what they're doing, that's a hell of a good place to start. So what I'd rather do is I talk to groups executives about their mechanisms or their processes. And what I ask them to do, I task smaller groups to take on key organizational processes where there's bias in them. The first step is to audit the process, the current state, and then to recommend to some group of senior executives a new state. Example, why do we have names on resumes? We don't need names on resumes. Because the name, and there's research, I'm not making this up, the name Shaniqua Jackson gets treated differently than Michael Smith. If you don't believe me, there's actual published research on obvious African-American names, obvious Arabic names, and obvious Anglo-Saxon names, obvious female names, and obvious male names. 
and male and female recruiters advance those resumes through the front end of the funnel dramatically differently. There's a mechanism we can think about in our hiring practice, just to use one silly example. But I need groups of executives, not groups of HR people, attacking key processes, auditing the current state, and working the future state. I can't do the behavioral stuff. It's just too frustrating. But I find that these people that we entrust to be enterprise leaders, vice presidents and above, they often got there because they're just excellent tactically and then somehow we think they're sophisticated enough to lead. I ask, I ask um, your senior leaders, you know, when you're putting together a strategic plan, how do you approach strategic questions? The answer invariably is we look at last year's strat plan and we iterate it. There's no divergent thinking, there's no scenario planning. There's five very specific strategic thinking techniques that I don't know how you get your executive leadership card if you don't know. It's unacceptable. So what we're doing is we're often adding behaviors and replacing, but replace very little. We're often adding behaviors in key decision-making areas. 